Thank you, Dr. Amar. And finally, I'd like to call back up Dr. Marty Taylor, who gave us his presentation in the afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Hi, everybody. Long time no see. Um, I, I guess I can, does this thing still work? I don't know if I can, okay, I'll try it this way this time. So, um, so we already did this disclosures part. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit more of a deeper dive into this transposable elements dark genome stuff that we do in the lab. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, transposable elements in the dark genome. I'll tell you why it's called the dark genome. What is it? Why should you care? And this is really all future application, so none of this is quite yet at the clinic, but I'll go through just a little bit of what we're excited about here and uh, a little bit of genomics and some things that you might not think about normally. So human transposons and the dark genome, it's, it's named after dark matter. And it was called actually junk DNA by the famous biologist Sidney Brenner recently passed. Um, and, and it actually got kind of put in the corner because of that and, and largely marginalized because this huge portion of the genome was just some junk, whatever. And, and Brenner eventually recanted as more and more people showed that there was something here. And he eventually said that, I called it junk DNA, okay, not trash DNA. You put the junk in your attic and you take it back out when you need it, the trash you throw out. Anyway, um, you know, the uh, sort of joking and, and the history aside, between half and two thirds of our genome are actually these same few sequences repeated over and over again with very little differences, whereas only about 2% of the genome are genes. So these DNA sequences that get mutated in cancer that we're very interested in and otherwise actually are a much, much smaller portion of the genome and a really small portion. And so this big piece of the pie, um, so the protein coding genes is that little gray bit in the bottom. And all of the, the a bunch of the, the big gray part on the left is actually also probably derived from these repeated sequences, but has changed so much over evolution that it's a little hard to recognize. And of these, these transposons, these mobile elements, these are virus-like sequences that can be understood in two classes. It's really quite simple. If you've used a computer and a word processor, you should get this. The first one is called cut and paste, and the second is copy and paste. And all the sequences want to do is make a new copy in a new place in the genome. Cut and paste or DNA transposons, these were how transposons were originally developed. Barbara McClintock won the Nobel Prize for this because this is how corn, if you've ever seen those corn ears with all the different color kernels, that's how that works. It's also how our immune system makes antibodies and T cell receptors that are really, really specific and potent. But the actual transposons that are trying to uh, cop, cut and paste themselves in the genome are no longer active in the human genome. They're still in fish, they're in bacteria, but there aren't any in humans. In contrast, humans have two um, classes of copy and paste transposons. One is called endogenous retroviruses and one is called line one. And both of them use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which is the same key enzyme that's active in HIV. Now, endogenous retroviruses look almost exactly like HIV. And shockingly, um, this is a, a huge portion of our genome. About 10% of the genome, 8% of the genome are these essentially dead copies of these endogenous retroviruses. Um, that are no longer active. Um, and they went, they went dead around when we were in a primate lineage about 15 million years ago. And so we call them dead in humans, although all of the pieces of the program are in the human genome, they're just not all in one place. So in cancer, actually sometimes some of those pieces get turned on and that's a thing that people are interested in and I'm interested in, but it's not most of what I'm gonna talk about. The piece that I'm gonna talk about is line one, which is, is active and it's still moving in the human germline. And there's a hundred active copies potentially in every one of our cells. So um, I'll go through this a little bit. So, um, so part in the molecular biology diagram, but hopefully I can walk you through this and this will make some sense. So a half a million copies and fragments of line one um, has written about a third of the genome and that itself is about 15 or 20% of the genome. And we've been evolving with these virus-like sequences since we were single-celled organisms for about 2 billion years, maybe even longer. And so it's a really complicated relationship over this long. We fight them and they have ways around the defenses. So in normal healthy tissue, they sit in the germline and our bodies keep them silent. But in certain disease states, including cancer, they break free. And the biomarker that I showed before is derived from line one called ORF1. So why should you care about it? Well, it's pervasively expressed in cancer. It appears that it could be a useful biomarker and the enzymatic activities, this reverse transcriptase activity, we think is a key part of cancer genesis. And sorry, my fonts 
something happened to my fonts. Anyway, we, we knew very little about how these work and we're starting to be able to crack into it. And that's allowing us to make new kinds of therapies. So the way this works, the copy and paste is that the copy just sits in the germline and it makes an RNA copy. This is how genes are made too. And the RNA goes out into the cytoplasm where like a virus, instead of just making its proteins that go do its business, the, the line one proteins like a virus bind back to the same sequence that made it. And what it wants to do is take that back into the nucleus where the ORF2 protein, the business end of the transposon is going to copy and paste a new version of it in a new place of the genome. If that seems bad, it's because it is. That's causing a mutation in a new place in the genome. Our cells really don't like this, and this is the outcome they're trying to fight. So two things can happen. First, the transposon can win, and it makes a new copy in a new place. And if that lands someplace important, we have a problem. And about 2% of colon cancers and a little bit less in other cancers are initiated in this manner. Now, this seems to actually be the vast minority of outcomes. And what seems to happen most of the time is that the cell is able to fight this and something else happens. Sometimes we win and we go back to where we started. But if the process gets started, it can scramble the genome and it can cause rearrangements and lots of damage. And we've also started to understand that the virus like elements can, um, can do something we didn't expect, which is that they can misfire too soon in the cytoplasm and they can make double-stranded nucleic acids in the cytoplasm, which then the cells think they're infected with a virus, or maybe it's a conserve response between the virus and the transposons, and that um, we think causes inflammation. So we've animated this. So I'll walk through it. The human genome contains half a million copies. A detailed high resolution understanding of the transposon. We may be able to develop new the effect of cancer prevention. That's the, that's the very expensive animation that we generated with a really fabulous company called Visual Science um, who helps us kind of share the message. So I hope I've explained this sort of um, very esoteric and previously weird and people thought, why are you working on this kind of part of biology? But now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about why we think this is actually interesting and where we're going with this. So going back um, to the 1990s, it had been known um, since Bert Vogelstein's lab at Hopkins found a line one that had landed in a tumor suppressor gene causing a colon cancer that this might be involved in cancer biology. But it wasn't until about 10 years ago that we made these antibodies that we could use to stain the line one proteins in cancer that we realized that this wasn't just a rare thing that was happening. We were shocked that in most cancer types, the majority of cases were positive. And in the intervening years, what as, as we've repeated the studies, as we've gotten better at the immunostaining, as other groups have done this, we've learned that this is a really pervasive part of epithelial cancer biology, carcinoma biology, especially gastroesophageal cancers, where in the recent paper, 52 out of 52 cases we stained were positive. So, um, and, and as I mentioned, as I showed earlier today, the normals are not positive. So this is a binary thing that's on in the cancer and not in the normal, and that creates some really interesting and unique opportunities. Um, so the first one is that we might be able to make a better diagnosis. Um, and so you guys probably in this room, Barrett's esophagus needs no introduction and it's, intestinal metaplasia needs no introduction, but I'll just say for any who don't know that this is a high risk precursor um, well, it's a precursor anyway that is increased risk. And depending on um, the kind of Barrett's, you go from non-dysplastic Barrett's, which with obesity could be in as much as 5 or 6 or 10% of the U.S. population, to um, precursors of cancer called dysplasia that are much higher risk, especially high-grade dysplasia. The problem is that the food and the reflux and the Barrett's are all in the same place. 
And inflammation and cancer can look very similar on the microscope, making it hard for pathologists to make a diagnosis. Sampling is also very challenging for the endoscopist. So we're not great at managing this clinically. And what we would really like to be able to do is to prevent esophageal cancer by finding people with Barrett's who are at higher risk earlier and doing the correct interventions. So we just tested them on the tissue level for um, the protein. And what we found was that the high risk precursors, high-grade dysplasias, were pretty ubiquitously positive, as were the cancers. And then what was interesting is the patients where pathologists couldn't agree that we call indefinite, five of the nine ended up positive for either the protein or the RNA marker that we had, and all five of them went on to later have the high-risk, high-grade dysplasia and a subsequent biopsy. So what we think this means is that this is a marker of high risk, and that if you're positive for this, that the lesion, at, at least for this level of expression that we can detect here, is something that needs to be treated with higher risk. So we need to do more work to understand this. And as I showed before, we can actually see this in the stomach as well, in precursors of both the diffuse and the solid type. And um, we think that this means that line one expression is on in carcinogenesis, and there's other data in the colon that support this idea as well. So these cancers are evolving in the presence of line one, whereas the normal tissue doesn't have it. And actually, one of the reasons that I'm still working on this and that a number of labs are still working on this is that we observed that if you put this on in tissue culture cells, some of which are derived from cancers, the cells stop growing and die. They really, really don't like it. But, but these cancers are evolving in the presence of this. So how does that work? How are these cancers tolerating this? And what is it doing to the cancer? Get into that more in a moment. So, some of those signs and understanding how these proteins work, we able to detect in one. This is all the one protein, one the shower looks like. It's really fancy that I won't go into in detail. We were able to model of what or and with some really technology that go into detail. Um, we we're able to detect. I think it gets into the blood in a similar way that the circulating tumor DNA does. So we were able to take these assays and show potential clinical utility. And I showed this earlier that we can see um, a patient responding or not responding throughout a clinical trial intervention, uh, a therapeutic intervention. So I talked about this earlier, so I won't go through this now, but I'll just point out that it was true in both gastroesophageal cancer and colon cancer in our patient population, whereas this identified a higher risk group if you were high for this marker. But the other piece that I wanted to talk about now in the context of prevention and early detection is what it looks like in healthy people. So I didn't have time to talk about this before, but we ran 400 healthy controls from our biobank. And of those patients, one was very positive and three were intermediate. And then the other 390 or 402 or something like that are sitting all on that flat line at the bottom where we couldn't detect the protein at all. Now that guy at the top up there thought he was healthy when he donated his blood to the biobank. And six months later is found to have an advanced prostate cancer that it's up his back and in his bones. Some of you know what that's like. It's awful as I understand it. I hope I never find out. So this, is, this got us really excited because this is the point, right, is that we might be able to run these tests on people and find somebody who's sitting there at home with an advanced cancer or an intermediate cancer that we could do something about. And now those other three dots, I'm worried about them. We don't know what's happened with them in between, but we're worried. And the reason I'm worried is that across about 1,000 cancer patients with different diseases, with this first-generation assay that we developed, and this is all published on, on Cancer Discovery now, um, we had between 20 and 30 and up to 70% detection of this protein in their blood. And we knew that in the tissue, when we had the tissue from the patient, that actually we could detect between 90 and 100% of many of these cancers. So we thought we could do better. So we went back to work and we made a better test by combining different capture and detection reagents in that assay in different ways. And we spent a lot of time on this and I won't go into the details, but we, we did a lot of engineering together with a really talented group in David Walt's lab and Kathy Burns lab, a really fabulous person in Connie Wu, who now has her own lab at Michigan. Um, we developed a series of these tests and what we were able to do with an ovarian cancer cohort, where the first generation assay that I just showed you in a, in a group we got from Rowney Drapkin at Penn detected about 50 or 60 percent of the patients. We were able to increase the sensitivity to pick up most of the patients or nearly all of the patients, including some stage one patients that were in the cohort. We were able to get to five of the six with a test that detected very few of the uh, healthy controls. And this one, we added it in a multi-analyte panel with other markers for ovarian cancer and basically a very baby MSED test, like we were talking about earlier, was able to shift the area under the curve up and help us discriminate better cancer from normal. Now, this is just proof of concept, but we're excited about the potential of this to be added with a garden test, to be added with a other, um, you know, 
methylation tests. There's many other really exciting tests in this space. And so we're hopeful that this will turn into something and we're working on it. We're also able to do um, better in gastric cancer. So Dr. Klempner at Mass General had a really nice cohort of patients and we took uh, 25 patients, sorry, 10 patients where we couldn't detect them in our early assays using our first platform. And we ran them on a separate platform that had just been developed in the Walt lab that is even more sensitive still. And we're able to detect nine of the 10 that we were missing. We've also been able to keep doing the engineering since it worked the first time and push the concepts and detect more of the gastric cancer patients that we had missed in the early tests in, in the old platform. So we're excited that we think we can keep making these tests better, but at some point we also just have to start rolling them out. So we're trying to do both of those things. Um, so that's the biomarker story. So we're interested in that for a couple of applications. The last thing I wanna just talk about is this carcinogenesis story. And this is a, a slightly simpler version of the slide that, that you just had up before. Um, Dr. Umar, that, that basically um, this is often called the Vogelgram after Bert Vogelstein, who drew the first one up in colon cancer. The exact same pathway isn't true in gastric cancer most of the time, but the same principle applies, which is that as you go from normal to cancer, there's a series of alterations that happen genetically, some of which we understand, many of which we don't. And the key mutations that we look for in the sequencing assays define the different stages of polyp in the colon. So as you get more and more mutations, you get a bigger, worse polyp, and eventually you get an invasive cancer. This pathway is called the chromosomal instability pathway in the colon, but what's really interesting is that the source of the chromosomal instability is unknown. And if you make all of these mutations in the lab in colon cancer-like cells, you can make things that look like the patient lesions in how they behave for metastasis. They're not chromosomally unstable. So we have a lot of data that suggests that line one might be doing some of this chromosomal instability, by getting into the genome and mucking it up, as I was mentioning before. So we're working on testing that going forward, um, but um, we think it could be a target for chemo prevention because um, if we're right, we could do a trial and there's drugs that we can use. So, so what are we thinking about? So this trial was published in Cancer Discovery last year. So the HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitors that uh, Dr. Marshall mentioned earlier, HIV in line one looks similar enough that many of those drugs are actually quite effective against line one. And David said, David Ting at Mass General, my colleague and clinical mentor said, look, um, if we could just give these patients this drug that's safe, they've failed all of their other options for colon cancer, maybe we can slow it down. And the trial failed its primary endpoint, but you can see from the waterfall plot there that all of those patients in blue had stable disease for some time. Um, and a couple of the patients had biochemical responses that we could measure by reduction in markers like CEA in the blood. So this is published. We don't understand who it worked for, why it worked exactly. Um, and we're more interested in general in the genesis than the advanced cancer. But this is a safe drug that can be used um, in established disease. And I was just having a conversation um, with somebody earlier about maybe we could think about uh, compassionate use of some of these drugs in people who actually have advanced cancer because they're so safe. So, um, wow, that font really does make it hard to see what I tried to say there. But um, this is some biochemistry that we've done in the corner. These are inhibition curves. Basically, the point is that um, we, we've taken and we've published this now, basically all of the existing HIV reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and essentially all of them inhibit line one to some extent or another. And the ones that are used for PrEP, for example, like Truvada are incredibly safe and are actually in combination quite effective against line one. And interestingly, epidemiologically, if you can find HIV patients who are stable, where their HIV is not progressing to the point that they're immunosuppressed, it appears in a number of studies that they have a really marked reduced risk of cancer. So we're very interested, and I was um, supposed to have dinner tonight with somebody at the NCI named Dr. Castle, who we've been collaborating with to try to do a trial in chemo prevention. Unfortunately, Dr. Castle's sick tonight, so I get to hang out here with you guys a little longer, which is awesome. Um, but I'm really excited that we might be able to get a trial off the ground at the NCI to see if we can prevent cancer in high-risk patients by using these drugs. Um, so that's really, um, the last thing I was going to say is that we've got some, um, this binary nature where line one is on in cancer and not in normal. I've talked about detecting it. I haven't talked about killing the cancer. So we don't think that usually the reverse transcriptase inhibitor will kill the cancer, but they might help slow down some things the transposon is doing. What I want to develop in my lab, and one of the things that we're just starting to work on now, is can we develop a new strategy to use the fact that this is in cancer cells and not in normal to kill the cancer? If we could, it might make a new universal cancer therapy. Of course, it's all pie in the sky until something works. 
but we're thinking about this day and night. We have two projects going to make a new kind of vaccine and also to make a new kind of small molecule. Um, and I'm really excited to try them in mice first. And if they work in mice, then I guess I'll get to talk to the FDA and everybody else and companies about trying to turn them into a real drug. So that would be the dream. Um, my hope is that through this kind of basic science, um, we can learn things that are important in cancer and we can develop new treatments and new tests that will make people's lives better and may prevent people from developing cancer in the first place. So, so that's the pitch. Um, so I'm really excited about the advocacy you guys are doing tomorrow. We need more funding. We've done most of this on a shoestring where we borrow from Peter to pay Paul to do the science we want to do, or we do it in our spare time because we have a lot of that. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really, really um, just deeply um, happy that you guys are doing this and move that you guys are, are really making a push to get more money for this kind of work. Um, we try to use whatever money we can get the best we can. And um, we are also trying to advocate for more. So thanks very much, everyone. Yeah, so I think the, the biggest thing is, is I, I'm trying to apply through foundations. You know, for this kind of work to specific gastric cancer underlying biology, there's two sources essentially, right? One is an NIH R01 type grant um, where you essentially convince another group of scientists that this is really exciting and innovative and, and, and great. And as we heard earlier, the pay lines for those are around 10%. So you have to have a really good grant. So we're trying to start doing that now. We have tried in the past and it's not been generally successful because it was unproven, because it was new. Um, the other major source is foundations where people who, for example, the De Gregorio Foundation and others often support this kind of really innovative work. The Kless Foundation has supported some of the work we've done. Stand Up to Cancer has supported some of the work we've done. Um, but so as far as advocacy, I think the two places are you know, it's hard to advocate to increase the NIH budget, but the moonshot may be a source where we can get it. Um, I mean, I would love it if the NIH budget would be like what the director said earlier today was going up in the way that that it um, that they were asking. That would be enormous for us. Um, I can't tell you how many people I know who have quit um, doing this kind of work because they can't get grants and they're tired of writing the same great grant over and over again and not getting it funded. So it's a really difficult situation. So the advocacy is is amazing. Um, yeah. Two questions. Uh, this is current presentation. Very exciting. Oh, thank you. Two questions in relation to the ORF1 protein. Yeah. First, does it need to be phosphorylated to be active? And second, you did show a pictorial uh, depiction of its structure. Yeah. Does it look like it's druggable? Well, we're trying to drug it. It's not druggable in the conventional way, but we're trying to use some new techniques to do it. Um, there, our own mass spec data showed it was phosphorylated going back 10 years, and there is a paper that's saying that phosphorylation is important for its activity. I'm not sure that that really matters that much in this case. It may or it may not. Um, a lot of the residues that are phosphorylated in humans are not that conserved, and the ORF1 protein from a whale can complement the one from a human. Um, but those PTMs may or may not matter. What we think matters more is that this, the ORF1 protein um, likely hides the transposon from the cell in a particular way. And we think we could break that. We also think that if we could drag it, like turn it into a degrader, if you're familiar with those ideas, that we could make a degrader that would just destroy the whole thing. I think Dana Farber has a, an actual center for protein degradation that's oh, yeah. working precisely on that. Yeah, there's lots and lots of people who are really good at making protax and all of these different, there's about, you know, I think every month there's a new strategy to use it now that we know that it's, it works. So the first step for that is making a binder. And so we have some and we're making proof of concept degraders actually in the lab right now. Um, so we're excited about it. Thank you. Uh, do we know a physiological activity for line one uh, besides just, you know, keeping transposons around? Yeah. And then um, uh, other question. Uh, do you think that it's maybe more likely that it's uh, more like a harbinger of chromosomal instability as opposed to like has any, you know, anything more than a side effect role? In yeah, the these, are, these are great questions and they're both controversial. 
Um, the first question is, why do we still have this, right? Why do we still have this thing? Um, the simplest explanation is it's just a good enough parasite that it's copying a little faster than we can get rid of it. And actually, some organisms have killed it. The mega bat, you know, those big giant bats that hang from trees, they don't have any more active line elements. They won. We killed Herv K, right? The endogenous retroviruses are dead. So that's the simplest explanation. And now there were some papers that suggested that line one was important in the brain, in development, that new insertions happen at some rate and they create some mosaicism. The normalizations were all wrong. And actually one of my um, colleagues at, Rock at um, Rochester has a mouse that has a, a genetic system to knock down the line one elements. They just have longer health span. They live on average 30% longer. They're neurologically intact. There's nothing apparently wrong with them. So, and the mice have been evolved for a very short amount of time, and they actually have 3,000 lines that are active, whereas we have 100. So the argument is that this is a thing that is essentially causing problems after we know we've reproduced, and so we've essentially not selected it out. Right, it's just a weak enough problem that it doesn't kill people, but enough of a problem that now we don't, we don't, we're not living in cave people anymore. Right, we live a lot longer, and it's becoming a problem. So that's the the first point. The second point was not does it do something, but um, is it is it a canary in the coal mine, basically? Right. It's yeah, only a canary in the coal mine, basically. Yeah. So there's a really I love this argument, which is that we've kept it around because it gets turned on when the epigenome gets messed up right? Because the epigenomic state is what keeps it down. And so it's a sensor of that. Um, it's a really cool idea. Um, it's hard to test it exactly, but we're interested to do so. The argument that we have is that it gets turned on with epigenetic dysregulation. And probably most of the time between the fact that cells really don't like it and they go into what's called a P53 mediated arrest and the inflammation that they induce together basically cause that stem cell to stop dividing and it probably gets pushed out of the epithelium. The problem is one in a million times, it doesn't. And when that happens, you've got a real problem because it can help select for a P53 mutation, we think. And now it's going to be pro-inflammatory and change the whole tumor microenvironment. I think I've gone way over time. Should we take one more? Quick, silly question, perhaps. No silly questions. <laughs> um, so what happens when you have a hiatal hernia in Barrett's? Does it all look the same in the hiatal hernia? So when they send it to me, because it's been taken out of the patient with an endoscope, it looks very similar to me. Um, the endoscopist doesn't think it looks the same. Um, and hiatal hernia is a treatable um, high-risk condition that causes reflux and increases risk of cancer. But uh, the carcinogenesis process is essentially the same in a hiatal hernia, Barrett's versus reflux Barrett's. And actually, there's ligation models in the rat where you can basically like tie a suture around a part of the bowel or the stomach and cause bile to reflux. And when you do that, you can create esophageal cancer that looks a little bit like human. So the thought is that obesity and reflux together are a high-risk situation, along with H. pylori that we just heard about. Uh, both are now modifiable with drugs, right? Obesity was really, really hard to treat. And now we're in this crazy time where people can get skinny with medication. Um, so that's been really exciting from my perspective. 